What really are we dealing with when we're including the infinite banking concept within our arsenal of tools, of weapons, if you will? Hey, welcome back to the VIP Financial Education YouTube channel where we help you go further faster financially while remaining safe in the process. Okay, so this is the episode today, guys. To my right, MC Lobsher, expert on the infinite banking concept and becoming your own bank. Super powerful tool, one of the most popular debt weapons that we, that we showcase here on the channel. So I'm always looking for tools that can help us uh, achieve results in an accelerated time period, but I don't wanna put everything on the line and I'm not willing to risk all of that. And that's where these types of debt weapons come across. And every time we discover one, I'm gonna share it with you guys. And that's where MC has been graciously willing to, to come in and teach. Now he's the, the founder and the, the host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast. Uh, he's based out of Pennsylvania. I really appreciate you obviously making the trip out. And we're gonna start diving into the meat and potatoes of this, this amazing, kind of idea that was really kind of brought to light by this guy, R. Nelson Nash. And so let's kind of, I just want you to take the show today and, and just share what really are we dealing with when we're contemplating including the infinite banking concept within our arsenal of tools, of weapons, if you will. And that's a great way to start the conversation is the framework that we use, right? So there's uh, four pillars that I talk about quite a bit, and I'll start with that to show you exactly where this will fit in. Okay. So the first part is cash creation. We all have to make money yes. using our intellectual and mental capital, our relationship capital, which will translate in financial capital. So we either do that through our jobs, we do that through our businesses, that's cash creation. The second part of that is cash capture. That's where we capture the value that we actually create. So there's a couple of ways that we can do that. You know, this is, uh, this is basically where capital will reside. Now, there's a couple of places, though, that we, we can put the capital. Mm -hmm. One of the places is banks. We talked about Most that. Obvious. Brokerage accounts, qualified, uh, qualified plans. And then we will discuss and get into insurance companies and life insurance companies. That's the second part. The third part of that is cash flow creation. Mm -hmm. That's actually leveraging where you position the capital, uh, leveraging that to invest in assets that produces cash flow, which we love. Yes, absolutely. And then guess what? The, ca the cash flow has to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Where do we put the cash flow that these assets create? It goes back to cash capture. The fourth pillar is cash control, which is tax, tax strategy, which is a big one, right? Taxes are the biggest wealth destroyer, mm. asset protection, and then, of course, legacy planning, estate planning type of stuff. So I just wanted to share that framework. So where our bank, if we're going to build a bank, our cash flow management system, where does it fit in? It fits in with cash capture. Mm -hmm. Second and, pillar. Yeah, the second pillar. And we use a dividend paying whole life insurance policy with a mutual insurance company to warehouse our, our cash. Okay. Now, I just wanted to share what the difference between a stock and a mutual insurance company okay. for, your, for your viewers. So stock insurance companies or companies like, for example, like AIG, right? They're listed on the stock exchanges and the owners of that insurance company is the shareholders, which are the stockholders, right? So it's still in the, in the Wall Street casino and it's managed to and steer towards generating profits for Wall Street. So there's still a mindset that they have to do things to drive profits so that more people buy their stock. So that's stock insurance companies. Now there's another type of insurance company which is mutual insurance companies. Mutual insurance companies are not listed on the stock exchanges. They're outside of Wall Street and the owners of a mutual insurance company is actually the policyholders, which is the shareholders. Similar to a credit union versus a bank, right? Yeah, so a, a mutual insurance company then uh, manages the, the, the company on behalf of the shareholders, which is the policy owner. So I like the fact that interests are aligned, mm -hmm. right, with the policy owners and the mutual insurance companies. Well, it min so, minimizes any possibility of abuse, right? I mean, or where it, they're targeting profits versus actually the benefit of all. Exactly, exactly. Trying to operate it, and these mutual insurance companies have been around, boy, 150 years plus. Uh, a lot of them uh, have been very profitable. Uh, most of them have paid out dividends, which we'll get to in a second, for over 100 years consecutively, which just basically simply means that they've been profitable every single year. So during depressions, 
uh, crashes. I mean, think of the loss on 2008, right? Most of these companies did not bat an eyelid. So they've been very well managed, very well run, and they've had a, have a track record uh, for over 100 years plus. So mutual insurance companies is where we set up this specifically designed dividend paying whole life insurance policy. So when I mean specifically designed is this is not the standard retail whole life policy that you will purchase out in the marketplace. This is the policies that are designed for maximum cash value. Because the goal of this, these, these policies, besides that it, it does have a death benefit, is to actually find a place to warehouse money, to put your money in. And there's a number of reasons why we would, we would actually choose a whole life insurance product with a mutual insurance company, a dividend paying um, whole life insurance product. And the first thing is guarantees. There's guarantees on the principle that you would put into, that you would put into the policy. There's also guarantees on the growth. Some of them have 4% over the life of the policy. So there's a guarantee on that. Guarantee on the principle meaning you can't lose your money. Right. So okay. the money that you've put in there uh, every single year with a guaranteed growth, uh, you're never going to see, for example, you know, you have $100,000 in the account right now, and then next year you open up, you log into your, your client portal, and you're like, well, now I only have 80 because something happened in the markets or outside of your control. So, so it, can only, it can only grow, it, it cannot can, lose it. Yes, it, it grows. So the, second, uh, the third part of it is because you're a shareholder of the company, a policy holder, you get to participate in the profitability through dividends, which they pay annually, right? Okay. Now that's not guaranteed, mm -hmm. but like- The first it's, two are though. The first two are. Mo the majority of these companies have paid them for over 100 years consecutively. So the other reason why we like it is, and this is, uh, this is one of the, the biggest reasons why a lot of folks love it, is the tax-free growth. Mm -hmm. The money actually grows tax-free in that, that policy. So it's not, uh, it's not like a qualified plan where it's tax deferred. So our philosophy on taxes is we try to legally pay as little as taxes on the seed so that we don't have to pay taxes on the harvest. Mm -hmm. So we pay taxes through different, we, uh, we limit the, the amount of taxes that we pay through strategies that we employ now, then we put money into the policy. So this isn't one of those vehicles where the money that you contribute to it is gonna be the tax deductible, for mm -hmm. example. The other uh, uh, part that I really like is that it's a private contract between you and the insurance company. So private meaning this isn't something that's public information. Um, which also leads into the next one where there's asset protection for this vehicle. So life insurance and specifically a whole life insurance in the majority of the United States, in all 50 states, they have some sort of type of asset protection. So check in the state that you, that you live in and that you reside in what the laws are, but in most states, it's, it has asset protection, which is very, very important if you think about it um, in the world that we live in today is very litigious. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a motor car accident or something and now somebody got seriously hurt and now there's lawsuits flying, what of your assets can they get to? Mm -hmm. If you just have a bunch of money in your, in your own personal checking account, mm -hmm. that's now open to, to, to folks, right? So that's the other part that I like it. And then I love the fact that it, it has the death benefit. So you could look at it in a sense that it pays a multiple of the, the account value. Mm -hmm. Compare it to a 401k or an IRA, let's just say. If somebody has a 401k, if that specific person passes away, not only will the beneficiaries uh, have some tax liability on that, but that's the money that they get. Where in these policies, you're gonna have cash value in these life insurance policies, but you're also gonna have the death benefit. So when you pass away, let's just say you have $500,000 of cash value and 2.5 million in death benefit, they're getting the 2.5, which is a nice multiple on the account value. That right, you because have. you don't lose the cash value when you die, correct? You get the, you get the death yep. benefit paid out to you. You get the death benefit, but what about the cash value? Well, you, we look at it as a multiple of the cash value because you have 500,000 in there, but you're getting 2.5 million. Because of the death benefit. Right, so you're not getting the 2.5, and then the, I mean, that would be really nice if we Right, operate. where you're double dipping. So you do right. lose the cash value, you're getting you the, gain the death benefit. You gain the death benefit. So okay. you have the 2.5, in that example, 500,000 is in, but you get 2.5 out tax-free. What is the most common death Death benefit that one would would apply for 
from an average health standpoint? What would I, as an average healthy 41-year-old man, be applying for with the death benefit side of it? Because my understanding of this as a tool, as a debt weapon, mm -hmm. is that the the death benefit aspect is being as underfunded as possible so that the cash value can be as overfunded as possible, the death benefit being really just sort of a cherry on top, if you will. Am I looking for more supplemental type of insurance through term in order to get me to where I need to be with that gap? Or am I, am I accepting the fact that uh, you know, if I have a half a million dollars in my cash value, I pass away, I have say only a half a million or a million dollars worth of coverage. Yeah. It is at least as much as I put in, I'm really not losing money similarly to some of my other retirement accounts, but there's also the tax advantages as well. What would be a what would be a mo the most common range? I mean, two and a half million sounds like a lot. I'm assuming most people don't have that type of coverage. Is that true? So, so here's here's how we can look at it. So uh, the first thing is there's you're limited to the amount of money that you can put into an insurance contract by your income mm -hmm. and your net worth. Mm -hmm. So that's why every single year you've heard people increase or add another policy, right? Why would they do that? Well, you're limited to the amount of premiums that you could put into a policy by your income and the death benefit. So as your income goes up and your net worth grows, you can actually add more, more coverage. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other question too is like, you know, what would I like to do? What type of strateg other strategies are there? And there's strategies, and one of, one of them that I personally use. So for example, let's say you're a 30 year old male, you make $100,000 per year. Let's just say you're even married, right? You have a spouse, you have two young children. On that $100,000, you would be able to put in $25,000 in premium, basically. Just the rule of thumb, I mean, it's, you know, the different carriers look at these things differently, but that's just kind of a way to gauge it. There's a potential earnings there that you could protect through this, right? So let's just take that. 100,000, this man that has a family with two young children, the potential of earnings over the next 30 to 35 years could be 3 million to 3.5 million, mm -hmm. right? So how do, you, how do you accomplish two things? How do you build an efficient infinite banking policy, a, a banking policy, and how do you get the basically the, the protection of potential earnings so that if something happens to him. Right, the 100,000 income isn't just thrown away. You don't, you don't lose the income potential. Exactly, so you can actually use convertible term insurance uh, to supplement that. So let's just, in that example, say his potential earnings is 3.5 million. And let's just say the banking policy has him at a million, death benefit, right? There's still 2.5 million that he's short. So if he passes away at that point and he's, his spouse with the two children actually get a check you know, for a million, they're not in a very good situation at all. Not compared to him being alive. Yeah. Exactly. So how do you overcome that? You can add a convertible term uh, for that 2.5 million, which obviously term has a, from a cost standpoint, is, is much more affordable. So now you can combine the two. So you have an efficient banking policy and you have an efficient term policy to protect the full insurability. Mm -hmm. And that's the nice part of um, essentially buying your net worth, if you think about it. Because if you think about the earnings potential that 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 particular individual has, it's 3.5 million at that point. So, you know, that's his potential earnings, which he can now buy and focus on producing and creating. Mm -hmm. You know, he knows that if something happens to him that he's taken care of. And I just think about myself too, you know, my, my peace of mind, knowing that I have stuff set up that way that if something does happen to me, that my family is taken care of, right. that allows me to focus on producing and creating in, in, uh, in the capacity that I provide value for, for the, the world, right? So, I mean, obviously, God forbid something happens to you. So we look at it as, let's assume that everything, we, still, we stay, stay alive a lot, lot, lot of years, right? Yeah. So then how do we kind of have our cake and eat it too, right? How do we get the living benefit out of this, which term does not provide, but also the whole life policy aspect of infinite banking can, in comparison, be considered or, or, and, and is often criticized for being very expensive. So you're, you're paying in where you don't have that access to the cash value right away. It's almost a forced savings account, but you're forcing a savings account that is, is actually worth less than the money you put in. And so from the first impression standpoint, my first critique would be, it seems like I'm paying for the cost of the agent commissions in the early stages. First couple years, I've got to obviously 
cover your expenses. I've got to cover the other agents that are you know doing the work. Yep. But uh, after t over time, it seems like this tool becomes much more valuable, and that the overall fees associated with your work or other agents' work uh, is actually much higher in other investment vehicles that are out there. Is that a fair interpretation? Because it seems like five years, 10 years down the road, the, the negatives of participating in an infinite banking policy begin to diminish. Yep. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, so there's, when you look at infinite banking, right, and this is how you would know if this is a good fit for you or not. So the first thing that I talk about is the long-term vision, the big picture view, right? Looking at things big from a big picture standpoint and a planning standpoint. What do I mean by that? If your focus is on the next five years and that's, what, that's all that you can see, this is probably not going to be a good fit for you. I agree. But if you are focusing in terms of uh, 10, 20, 25, and 30 years, it's extremely, extremely powerful. And I know we'll talk about some case studies and some examples of that. Um, but it's extremely powerful over the course of, 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 of I would say, tw you know, 10, extended period, decades. an extended period. Yeah. Not that it cannot be powerful already, because if these pr policies are structured correctly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, cases are written, underwritten completely differently, right? Mm -hmm. So there's different ages, there's different uh, underwriting tables and so forth. But what we try to do is have at least 70% of the premiums available in cash value year one. Okay. So, so you have access to substantially more money than you would have in a other in other types of traditional retirement accounts before you're penalized. I mean, you go into a 401k, you go into an IRA, oftentimes you you don't have access to the same, to the liquidity either, which is also one of the perks of this of this tool as well, correct? Yes, the liquidity, the money inside these policies is available to you to use at your discretion for what you choose, whether it's purchasing automobiles, whether it's investing in real estate, it's at your discretion. You have access to that liquidity, which is the huge benefit. And also the other thing that you mentioned too, the agent commissions and fees and that kind of stuff. How I look at this personally, because uh, I eat my own cooking, is that there's price, cost, and value to everything that you do. There's, def there's a price that something is, a sticker price. There's a true cost of something and not doing something. And then there's an overall value. And by the way, advisors too. I talk about the return on advisors right. when I look at folks. And most of the people in my network that I use, whether it's a tax strategist, whether it's an asset protection uh, uh, individual and professional, there's a return on that advisor. And a lot of them, my returns are enormous if you just think about it from a tax standpoint. So I would look at a price, cost, and value. So if you can look at the value that this has from a big picture perspe uh, perspective, for me personally, it was a no-brainer. Yeah. Other people might beg to differ, right? And and I'm happy having discussions with anyone. Well, I think see, sitting and down and looking at the math, yeah, I mean, it has to make sense from ROI wise. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about who this isn't for, because I've always been convinced that this is this is not a great tool for for most people. Right? Yes. We actually had a really interesting conversation about entrepreneurship and seemingly share many of the same viewpoints regarding uh, the the idea that most people really are not great candidates for, for you know, starting and building a business. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just think it's, it's nice to be ruled out sometimes, early. Spare me the time. Why, why should I go down this rabbit hole trying to understand something if almost immediately I could understand that something's not good for me? Yes. And so let's backpedal a minute and, and talk real quickly. Who would be considered ruled out from this immediately? First of all, internationally. To have the policies designed that the way that we're discussing it right now, you have to reside in the United States or Canada. Okay. So for the, for the, for the majority of the world, uh, they don't necessarily have the, the mutual insurance companies set, set up and structured as they are in the United States and Canada. Um, the principles they can still use in other vehicles that we are discussing. Um, and maybe this, they could get creative uh, right. trying to find vehicles with the same, with the same uh, kind of- the, uh, Some of the same benefits. Yeah, I mean, so the concept of debt weapons in general and using different tools to further yourself financially is universally applicable, I would argue. Yep, right? yep. Um, and so, okay, so US and Canada, uh, age ranges. Uh, it, again, just based on the, the limited knowledge I have, it seems as though 
you know, health is a major concern, right? Yep. The older we get, the less healthy we are. I mean, I, I realized that the, the moment I turned 40 and fell down walking across the street and broke a couple ribs, right? It's yes. like, okay, well, now obviously I'm fragile. So I, I want to understand, is this still good if you're north of 40, if you're north of 50, if you're north of 60? At what point does this become too expensive for the insurance piece that I would be better off putting my money into something else? There's basically three types of, um, I would say, stages that people are at. So the first stage is there's folks that are young, they're starting out. Uh, they have a lot of time, but they don't necessarily have a lot of resources or money. And then the second piece is folks that are now, let's just say in their 30s, 40s, um, maybe even early 50s, they're in the peak. Your prime earning years is 45 to 55 statistically. So they're in their, their prime earning years, they still have a lot of time, and they now have resources to deploy, right? There's different strategies for the first phase, there's different strategies for the second phase. And then the third phase is folks that are in their late 50s, uh, in their 60s, and then also in their um, 70s. There's, now they, they don't have a lot of time, but they have a lot of resources. There's actually a lot of strategies that they can utilize and in incorporating something like this into what they're already really? doing. Okay. So there's a lot of money moving outside of brokerage accounts, for example, for retirees. Let's just say you're in your 60s, and most people, if you're listening to pundits out there, um, in the crystal ball business would say we're at a market top and there, we could be in for some choppy weather or choppy waters rather in the future. They would move money out of, let's just say, a brokerage account into insurance policies and create a private pension for themselves out of, um, through the policies on how they're structured. Okay. So that's something worth considering, obviously, is potentially transitioning in order to protect yourself from volatility and continue to recognize and, and, and ensure that there's growth. Because like you said, you can't lose, you can only upside, and they've been paying out for 100 years, so it sounds like that's a pretty short bet, right? So what are the typical ranges of growth rates? I mean, what are you seeing as far as uh, returns on these policies in most cases? Well, you'll have a 4% return over the life of the policy, and then dividends are usually between 6 and 7% right now. Mm. Historically, pretty low of where we're at right now. Mm. Okay. Well, that seems pretty favorable. Uh, okay, so uh, U.S. and Canada, sounds like there's consideration at a, a, quite a, a diverse uh, collection of age ranges, yep. so worth at least sending an email, right? Yep. What about income levels, right? Because we know that this is generally going to require a consistency based on cash flow. Uh, a lot of our coaching members are relying on this tool. We know that it's important for us to be involved in order to maximize cash flow so that affordability is optimized and you still have all the extra wiggle room necessary to, to participate in all of the objectives that we're working towards. Yeah. What is uh, you know typical net minimum cash flow percentages or numbers from a specific dollar amount, let's say every month, for somebody to even really consider this, consider starting off with it. I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that you would say, oh, somebody that's, that's at $500 in leftover monthly cash flow should dive into a, a whole life policy where they're consuming most of or all of what they have left, right? I mean, it's too risky at that point because if you stop making payments on your policy, it's, I'm assuming, going to lapse and you're going to lose the yeah. cash value and the death benefit. I mean, yeah. you, you throw everything away if you can't afford it. Is that true? Yeah, there's, there's, there's uh, certain folks that are starting out or maybe they're rearranging their finances and building up savings and so forth. Um, what this is a good fo a fit for is for someone that could put $10,000 basically away um, comfortably in a policy such as this. And what we usually talk about too is, you know, if you're saving, if your savings is 20,000 over the course of the year, then, you know, between 15 and $10,000 might be a good uh, place to start and in looking at some of this policies. Right, 10,000 annually. Yes. Broken out into monthly installments. Yes. Not 10,000 on one installment in the front end. Yes. Okay. Yeah, which as you guys very well know, is a, is a difficult number for uh, too many folks in this country right now. Um, mm -hmm. We're fortunate to, to draw a, a savvy audience that does well by and large, but I, I know for sure that there are members that are listening to this right now that are still trying to get their feet underneath them. And it would not be the appropriate time to consider this tool. This tool does require you 
to be in a comfortable enough position to afford it. That is a bit different than some of the other debt weapons we talk about. Uh, obviously, many of those debt weapons do require an application to be approved, which obviously means you've got to show financials are strong enough for other more traditional lending institutions to sign off on your app. So it's not as if you can be broke and get those other tools, even though you don't have to put a lot of money up front like you do on a monthly basis into this. So this is a very much almost like a forced savings plan with a much higher yield each year, right? Mm -hmm. A tax advantage, It's uh, there, there are legacy advantages to this. All of those features are tremendous. Not to mention you have the liquidity factor where you have access to the money, but it continues to grow as though you didn't pull it out, right? Yep. And so you'll pay yourself back. You're basically keeping the loans inside your own family. And that is the power behind this. But I think that that helps a lot. Are there any other real black and white examples where you're saying, if, if you fall into that category, it's best to wait or this just isn't the right tool for you? Yeah, I would say that if you're, like I said, restructuring a lot of your finances, you're building your savings and so forth, this wouldn't be something that you would jump in. This is more for uh, someone that has already built a I would say restructured has an infrastructure basically for savings and for money um, and have, have already saved up a little bit of money. So I would say that would be a good fit. I think, you know, some things um, like debt could be very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. The same with life insurance, but used in the right capacity with the right knowledge and in the right circumstances. This is the exact same thing. Great. So guys, if you want to get yourself into a position where an infinite banking policy can fit into your game plan, make sure you reserve your one free coaching session through VIP at freecoachingcalendar.com. For those of you that are ready to just take off and get your money under control with a very advanced easy to follow roadmap. You can go ahead and sign up at that same website for an ongoing coaching plan with VIP. And then we'll take a close look at your circumstances together to determine that it's compatible. And if it's not, when we just reserve, we reverse the uh, tuition cost. We, we avoid the membership for now. And we determine when a better fit will be, but we can at least put you guys on the right path to where you can benefit from this. Now, if you're already savvier, you've got your plan in order, it's been working for you, you have the extra cash flow, this could be an excellent place for you to branch out and begin to build more tax-free wealth that, uh, that will help not just you, but future generations in your family as well. So go ahead and email. Uh, we'll do ninja at vipfinancialeducation.com again. You can send an email again to ninja at vipfinancialeducation.com. We'll pass it straight to MC and his team. These guys will take great care of you. And like I said, it's the same style that we have here at VIP, non-solicitous, always concerned about you and your family's future first um, and before he's concerned about you know his own wages as a result. Always value first. So if you haven't checked out Cashflow Ninja, the podcast, you got to listen to it. Guy's got over 500 episodes with some of the most well-known, most popular experts and specialists in the financial world. So you guys can build wealth by learning from him as well. And uh, make sure you're a subscriber to this channel. We're going to dig further into this and keep unpacking it because I love this tool. And it is one that uh, for those of you that it is a good fit for, I want you to, to get, get as much knowledge as possible. So we'll see you on the next episode, guys. Until then, make it a great day. Take care. Money on my mind, take my money on my mind.